<laughs> so uh, here we are in the attic, in our respective attics, uh, where, where we spend our days at the moment. Is that true? Is that the same thing? Mooching about, looking at uh, old uh, lost things. For entertainment, <laughs> I've been doing I've been doing these things on on Instagram where I I, I I find I play a lot of records at the moment because I've kind of got the patience to do it. You know, I leave them leave them to play, and I've also been posting on Instagram what I what I played. And this is what this is what I posted today. Do you remember this? I do and remember this, that. Oh, this, I do. This is this is families bandstand bandstand from. 1973 or something like that. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? That I mean, family never sold a lot of records, but obviously, you know, they could get really expensive, complex sleeves done for them in those days. And I, I played this, and I actually, I really enjoyed it. You know, it's got My Friend the Sun on it. Do you know My Friend the Sun? I remember. Uh, and, and I found other family albums. I found even more here. Fearless. Fearless, which is extraordinary kind of incredible cover you know, it's like a children's book um you know i mean conspicuously expensive but i love the idea that yeah that people invested um, it was like the is it catch a fire by by bob marley and the whalers yeah yeah yeah. with the zippo lighter that that, that record companies invested huge amounts of money into those things because they got it got you attention, didn't it? It did. It was the only thing that did get by Jethro Tull. I mean, one of the reasons that I first got hold of that as a mate of mine came up, I said, have you seen this record? Look, you open it up and the it band stand up. up and it's called Stand Up. It, absolutely. And listening to it was a sort of secondary consideration. But yeah. looking at it, you know. But also, don't forget, in those days, uh, as I recorded in some detail in my, in my new out of paperback book, Superb <laughs> book. Fabulous creation. Applause to match that, which uh, was <laughs> About... uh, done for the NHS the other night. About about the uh, you know the era of the LP was that the main way you interact with LPs was you went into shops and you kind of read them, didn't you? You felt them long before you actually heard them. You know, so your your re initial relationship with them wasn't so much with the music; it was with that thing. Completely, it was with the, with the mythology. It was looking at pictures of people, which was so precious, you know. I'm sure we've had this conversation before, but you used to go to concerts back then and, and have no idea sometimes what members of the groups that you were about to see actually looked like. Yeah, absolutely. It's inconceivable now. You think, well, who, what are, you know, you see all their positions that they set up with their instruments. You think, who's going to occupy that microphone stand? No idea. I can remember when JJ Kale first came to the UK, I went with my wife. I don't, we weren't married at that point. Um, so it wasn't Hammersmith Odeon, was it? It was probably Hammersmith. Yeah, I think it's Hammersmith. Yeah, I saw that show. And it started with the, you know, the, the, the curtains opened or whatever it was. The lights went up, and there were five or six musicians sitting on chairs or stools, were they? And he was right. Was he right? Juggling away. <laughs> no, they, and they were just in a, in a little. It was like a, a string, a string quartet or quintet or whatever. That's how they set up. There was no star, star or anything. And uh, and they just started chung, 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 chung. <laughs> But you had no idea which one J J. Yeah, Kale. My, my wife said to me, "Which one's J J. Kale?" That's right. and, I, <laughs> and I turned to her with that very superior kind of this classic early version of mansplaining. I said, "He's not on yet. <laughs> He'll come <laughs> on in a minute." And as soon as I I had said that, one of these when I started singing, lead towards the microphone again. They call me the breeze or whatever. <laughs> So it's about so the things I've found in my attic. I've just found this. Do you remember these? Do you remember this? This is the BBC sound effects record. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, which subsequently, you know, the jam made an album called Sound Effects, didn't they? Which was it which was kind of modeled on the on that yeah. uh, on that and that kind of you know, the whole point about this is we just see us surrounded by junk and you know, everywhere you reach there's there's junk that's kind of in some way noteworthy, actually. I, I've just, I just found that well, this is not junk, certainly not junk. This normally sits on my, um, on my desk, but for some reason I moved it over here. This is a giant, fabulous reproduction of the great Chuck Berry's You Never Can Tell, uh, done by Morgan Howell, a friend That's of the podcast. That's beautiful, isn't it? Um, uh, of course, that is, as any fool know, the greatest record ever made. And uh, rather beautifully, you know, reproduced there by Morgan Howell. It, it does 
does these things under the name of super size art, which I do, I do urge you to look up. I'll tell you what I also found in. Do you, do you know what that is? Oh, it's a Rolodex. Is it a Rolodex? It's a, yeah. It's a Rolodex. And it's what people used to keep all their, all their phone numbers on. And when people used to, um, used to change jobs in record companies or film companies or whatever, they always used to say they got hired just for their Rolodex. That's right. Just for the value for the of the Rolodex. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, I, and so I was flicking through it and I found all sorts of interesting old numbers. I found Chris Evans' number from when he probably lived in a cold water flat somewhere in, in Haverstock. Haverstock yeah, Hill. that's right. Yeah, it was. Uh, rather than occupying all of Kent, as I think he does now. But uh, your phone number is still the same one as it was 35 years ago or something like that. It's because I haven't moved. <laughs> How thrilling is my life? I've got a little um, a, a book as well of all the contacts that I have from about the late 70s, you know, and it's got the kind of, uh, you know, it's got the, the home number of Laura Logic from Essential Logic. And all three members of the Dolly Mixtures, and, uh, and the dad, and under, Captain Sensible, uh, you know, is Captain Sensible under his name Captain Sensible? Yeah, he's under he's under S for Sensible. <laughs> Just your name, Captain. He's there. Where do you stand? On, you where do you stand on the filing of records? Do you do you do it alphabetically? Alphabetically, yeah. Now, where do you put Captain Beefheart? Oh, that's good. I put him under C, actually. Really, I think would I'd that be right? Because that's no, the I'd, one, I'd that's official name, I think. C, I, put him, yeah. I put him under B. It's Mr. Beefheart, isn't it? Mr. Beefheart to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the way I look at it. But to, you know, people people do debate these uh, these issues during the long winter evenings or during during lockdown. People anyway, do it by people do it by uh, by themes, don't they? I've got some upstairs with kind of strange psychedelic records and all that and certain things, which is not under alphabetical, which means it's impossible to find them. But I forget I've got them at all. So reach down. What have you got on your feet? Well, I've got some. I've got some old uh, analog um, uh, kind of old technology things. I'll very quickly show you, which I'd forgotten all about. Do you remember Flexi Pop, nineteen eighty? Re remind me. Go on. Re Flexi Pop. When we were at Smash It, uh, a guy called Barry Kane, who was at Record Mirror, launched a magazine that had a free Flexi single on the front. You remember? Because singles were so expensive that you would have bought this for sixty p because it had a free single by the selector on it. Yeah, so that's old technology. Sniffing glue. Old. To find a wow. copy of Sniffing Glue. Yeah, with a brilliant editorial by Danny Baker, where he's he's gone to a gig and uh, Elvis Presley's just died, and they're all celebrating the fact that Elvis Presley's just died, and he turns around and he gets up on stage and berates this audience viciously, El and then writes Danny, a fantastic editorial. You know, read about how read appalling. It. Said there would be. A, said if there's you know without Elvis Presley, you know there wouldn't be a punk rock. Um, yeah, well, look. So what, Danny stood up and, and actually held forth yeah. to be on stage. That's extraordinary. Yeah, he does. Presley gave youth a fucking voice for the first time, which died till we got it back again. <laughs> Forget the man, I ain't talking about anyone. I'm talking, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's all about just how, uh, how you know, they've, got to, they've, they've, they've still got, they've got to recognise that Elvis Presley is the kind of source of all this, you know. Yeah, yeah, Quite yeah. Quite interesting. No, but yeah. I saw that, and then I, I found... Oh, uh, the enemy. The God. enemy, it's the enemy from 1979. Open it up. Go on, read, read us something on the news pages. Go on. Oh, no, on the news, okay, news what's pages. What's the lead story Thanks on the news pages? I want to know. We've got uh, The Grateful Dead have pulled out at Glastonbury. Oh, right. Okay. So I didn't even know they were going to play. So there we are. Commander Cody's added another three dates. I see. John <laughs> Lydon is about to appear on Jukebox Jewelry. <laughs> the Cramps have just completed a UK tour with the police and are about to do some dates on their own. <laughs> and Leighton Buzzards are headlining a charity show. This is fantastic, isn't it? The Leighton Buzzards. There's a little thing, there's a little thing of a news roundup, which you think punk hasn't happened. Look, we've got uh, Roy Hill, we've got C.P. Lee, Darts plan extensive tour, Maddie back in new band. What, Maddie Pryor? Maddie Pryor. Wings are on Radio Luxembourg. And <laughs> Kevin Coyne and Dagmar Krauser are appearing <laughs> at the Stafford Theatre Royal. That's fantastic. I noticed also that it's the 10-year it's the anniversary. That's interesting. 10-year anniversary of the death of Brian Jones. So there on that the front. Was. It yeah, advertises. Yeah. yeah, this is 1979. Uh, yeah. When did he die? 69. He died in 69. Yeah. 69, I think. Yeah. Only 10 years before. Can you remember the first review you wrote? Um, yeah, it was Elvis Costello and the Attractions at the Nashville Rooms. Um, it's supported by the Soft Boys, I think it was. Uh, yes, and it was, oh, it was shockingly bad. What did you say? What was, the, what was the last line? <laughs> Bound to go far. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, remember where you heard it first. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, something like that, probably. Yeah. Oh, Keep an eye yeah. on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Bright future awaits. I don't know. God, it was awful. Can you remember yours? I think mine was possibly the Amazing Rhythm Aces Too Stuffed to Jump uh, album for the NME. And no, I can't remember really what I said. But, you know, let me tell you, there's no point chucking away your old um, reviews thinking that that in any way will suppress them and they'll never be heard of again because everything is out there. Everything them. is out there. I can Forever. come back to haunt you at any stage. Forever. And people, people occasionally get in touch and say, mm, I think you were a bit, little bit ungenerous to, I don't know, Clive Bunker in 1981 or something. And you think, oh, God. You know, you wrote these things in such a tearing hurry. You know, uh -huh. you, you you had to do what you had to do. You had yeah. to fill a page or whatever. This thing here. Do you remember you and I, 15 years ago, went to the Battle of the Somme? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Went to the Battle of the Somme. We went to the Battle of the Somme. When does it start? <laughs> Oh yeah, when's the kickoff? We went to the battle of Somme. We, we went to the battle. We're so lucky we're to get Somme. Sorry, we're the Somme battle. We weren't. You're the guest. <laughs> well, you're the guest, Liz. Uh, yeah, no, at uh, at uh, Loch Nagar Crater was it Bo near Beaumont Hamel? You remember? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. we had a look around, and we found all sorts of bits of old shell casing, of uh, of, uh, of of the armaments, and I've still kept them up in the attic. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> I, I hope it's not an explosive in any way. No, no, I don't think so. Because there's terrible stories about people taking things back from battlefields. Well, they and then went off. Years later, 40, yeah. 50, 60 years later. Yeah. You know, what is it? Was it the story of the, uh, the mines of Messine? Are they near Ypres? I think they are. Oh, right. And there were three, you know, people who read bird songs, Sebastian Fulk's bird yeah, songs, all, all across this, you know. Brilliant book. They, Doug and you know, you know miners would dig right under the enemy lines and put the clay jump. kickers. And uh, and there were three of these three huge <coughs> mines under the German positions of Messine, and they were all detonated at the same time. Only one went off. That's right. One went off like two years later. The third one still yeah. not gone off. It's still not gone off. That's chilling. <laughs> And on that thought, we'll leave you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.